The presentation is about um, traditional ecological knowledge and how it contributes to deep growth. Um, and I thought Tom was going to start first and give this introduction on degrowth, uh, but no. So <laughs> I will just. Uh, so why degrowth? Uh, basically, it's because of this problem of growth. Uh, so now you have the society that's riddled with consumerism, continuous economic growth, uh, and, and people that are like drowning in the system are in continuous denial of whether it has any negative effects on the natural environment. I mean, they're just blind to it. And, and it's all about wealth and, and as if you can keep having this certain kind of growth without any negative effects on the national environment. And I think that it's also, in some kind of ways, it's ridiculous. It, it, this kind of growth has seeped into our society where we don't want to talk to other people anymore. There's no sense of community living. It's all about, I mean, yes, individualism is nice, but then it's, it's in, this, in this manner that people just want to be with themselves. And also, uh, you can pretty much invent and create anything. And somewhere in the world, somebody will think that it's important to the sense that it's absolutely necessary for survival. Some things that we create these days have, have no, like if you think about it, if you, if you remove yourself from the system and then think if this, this substance is actually necessary, it really isn't for survival. So for me, I think growth has reached these perverse levels where things don't make sense anymore. And so you have this concept of the society that's coming up uh, of degrowth. It was introduced, I think, in 2006 uh, in France. And so uh, it's this concept about community living and uh, c controlling consumption, using resources that are locally produced, uh, and the sense of harmony and using things that are only absolutely essential. Um, so how does traditional ecological knowledge contribute to this concept of deep growth. Um, so firstly, what is traditional ecological knowledge? Um, it's basically, thanks Bob. Uh, it's basically knowledge, belief, and practices that are possessed by either indigenous communities or traditional communities or local communities. And these are different kinds of communities, but we don't have time for that today. But you can basically think of it as knowledge that are possessed by traditional communities. And the characteristic of this knowledge is that it's formed from daily experiences over thousands of centuries. And also this knowledge varies from place to place. So it's highly local, it's very region specific. And also it's passed from one generation to the next orally. So either through folk tales or stories or songs, um, also you had paintings, and more recently, if there are any communities still living like this, then you also have some written forms. Um, but the most important thing about traditional ecological knowledge is the way it looks at the natural world. So it has this holistic viewpoint. It, it considers everything as interconnected. So if you look at this indigenous community in Canada called the Métis, then they say that everything in the environment is interrelated and that relation is extremely sacred. So, so they consider everything, um, the atmosphere, uh, every organism, plant, but also imagination, dreams, knowledge, economic needs, everything, your thought, who you are, how you are, everything is interconnected and all these relations are considered extremely sacred. So um, this is traditionally positive knowledge and this forms the basis of communities, like the characteristics of these indigenous communities. Now, I'll just show you a few things that I picked up. First is resource management. Uh, it's a term that we use, but obviously the communities themselves don't use this fancy term. Um, so if you look at resource management, I'll take you to Australia and the Aboriginal communities there. Now, in very general terms, these communities actually have clan names. Each clan has a name. And these names are given based on a native species or a native landmark in that particular area. 
Now, if you belong to that clan, you are told not to hunt the, the native species because it's kind of the symbol of your clan, so you're venerating it or you, you respect it and you don't hunt it. But obviously other clans can, can hunt these species, these re representative species or whatever. So this is a painting by an Aboriginal Australian uh, named Nairu and he is from the clan of the honey ants. So this is his painting of honey ants. So obviously this community is told that they are not allowed to hunt honey ants. And another important factor is that they are, they are told that you should continuously sing about your stories of the honey ants and make these paintings. The reason being that if you stop doing that, then these honey ants will die and so will the clan. Now if you think about it, there's a very deep thought that right there where they think that if you don't pass this knowledge from one generation to the next, you will die because the honey ants will die. And if, if, there, are, if there are people here who are like, you know, that doesn't make sense, well, if you look at biology, the biology behind honey ants, the honey ants collect honeydew from aphids, and aphids feed on plants. So, so after aphids feed on plants, they secrete honeydew, which the honey ants take. Now, if honey ants don't feed on this honeydew from these aphids, then it tends to accumulate on these plants and, and form a surface for fungi growth, which, co which causes destruction of these plants, destruction of any fruits that are growing on the plants. And so, these honey ants are extremely important to use this honeydew and not allow its excess accumulation on the plant. And I'm sure we all have a sense, an idea of food web. So producers are right there in, in, in that food web. They're, they're the base, they're the foundation. So if there are no plants, the community can survive. So something like this, the community has figured out themselves. And this is the concept, this is the knowledge that drives their survival. And this is also a factor in degrowth. Degrowth looks at resource management at the local level and consumption of <coughs> local resources but in a, in, in, in a properly managed way. Another factor is human cooperation and community living. So uh, indigenous communities are all about community living. Um, but how is it brought about? Sometimes you have uh, really crazy stories, just folk tales that don't make sense. For example, again in Australia, you have um, this folk tale about the bow bird. That's how it actually looks on the right. It's dull. But the story goes like this, that there was this land that was green and fertile and wonderful, uh, but the people never spoke to each other. And if they ever did, it was to fight and argue and complain. And so the, the great spirits got really annoyed and sent down the bow bird and, and the bow bird landed on the land and collected all the colors of the land and then flew away. And then the people told the spirits, well, see what the bow bird has done. It's taken away all, all the fruits of the land and we can't survive anymore. I and mean, what, what's going to help us survive? And the spirit said, well, if you're going to keep fighting and arguing, then the bow bird will never come back and you'll have to travel far for food. So, the, such kind of folk tales are repeated from one generation to the next. Now, it doesn't matter if they sound ridiculous or not, but at least it helps the community understand the importance of living together harmoniously. Um, another important factor about um, such indigenous communities is the fact that they're very diverse. No two communities will ever be the same. Uh, if you look at cultural diversity, for example, uh, in India, uh, you have this the highlighted state there in the northeast, it's called Meghalaya. It literally translates to a place in the clouds. Um, and it's really small, but then you have three different um, tribes that occupy the place, the Garos, the Khazis, and the Jantias. Um, completely different practices, completely different beliefs, uh, because of where they come from and, and, and the region that they occupy. So it's extremely diverse and even the language that they speak is different. So that brings us to linguistic diversity. 
that these indigenous communities, they have such specific languages. Now, why a language is important? Well, they have, I, I would like to say that they, they have secrets, they hold secrets to, to the land that, to the land in which the community lives. So, the communities have the sense of understanding of plants and animals, and they have names for everything, and names for relation, relationships between the plants and animals, which are like hidden secrets which even we will never understand because we don't know that language. But that's the beauty of it. Um, any idea of that country highlighted? Papua. Yeah, Papua New Guinea. Any idea of the number of languages in Papua New Guinea? 850. And as different as English and Chinese. But just to say, out of 850, they say that 12 are completely extinct. 36 are in the process of dying, which means that you have either one speaker left or between one and hundred speakers left. And uh, the rest are well taken over by the colonizing languages. Um, another character is biodiversity, the, 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 the amount of knowledge these communities have about the biodiversity. So let's not look at you know, lots of plants and animals, but let's just look at, for example, in India and just rice. Uh, I personally have eaten just two varieties mm. of rice, but when I read this paper, I realized that before the green revolution in India, that's before the machines took over agriculture, you had two lakh varieties, two lakh is 200,000 varieties of rice. Um, and now there are obviously efforts in India where indigenous farmers are being given incentives to, to to cultivate these varieties of rice because they are the only ones who know how to cultivate these varieties. In fact, there was an, a conference last year where you had certain farmers from the northeast of India cultivating 100 varieties of rice that can be only grown in flooded conditions, and so on and so forth. So this is the extent of biodiversity. Um, and the main principle behind indigenous living is live well and not better. And this relates with the, the idea of degrowth, where especially you have this concept of voluntary simplicity. So it's almost the same. Uh, and especially this principle is in many indigenous communities in Latin America, where they say, live well in the sense that live happily and live a healthy life, but not better. Because better in, in the sense that it's very competitive. So this life is not about living better than somebody else, but living as well as somebody else. So the way they look at the future is in a very non-developmental way and it's not quantitative, it's not about how many TVs or how many computers or how many cars you have, it's just about how happy you are as a person and as a community. Uh, so this is how it relates to, to deep growth. The, the, the kind of goals, ideas are the same. But also I thought I would make use of this presentation to kind of show you guys about the different problems that indigenous communities are facing around the world, or traditional ecological knowledge in itself. And one, you guys might have heard, and that is Kathakwe and uh, Four days back about the Ecuador indigenous leader being murdered. Uh, he was protesting uh, against um, the mining of oil uh, in Ecuador, uh, in the Ecuadorian <coughs> Amazon forest. Um, so these are the things that are happening to them. Uh, they're, they're stopped, they're, they're moved away from the areas they occupy, uh, and they're, they're not allowed, forget being happy and healthy, they're not allowed even to survive. Another one is the disappearing languages, like, like I mentioned about Papua New Guinea. Um, the ones that are shown in red are all the severely endangered languages, and the ones in orange are the endangered. And all these languages are disappearing and replacing them is hello and Spanish and uh, so if it doesn't matter to anybody in this room whether languages disappear or not then well if from a philosophical sense you can imagine how would you feel if you were not allowed to speak a native language anymore and not you. <laughs> uh, but how would you feel if you were not allowed to speak a native language because if you speak a native language it means you cannot live a good life. It means you, if you leave your native language behind, you get education, healthcare and so on. It's not fair. But more so because 
as I said before, the kind of secrets that these languages hold, they can never be retrieved. The kind of understanding that they have of their own regional environment, which has been formed over centuries, it can, it can never be retrieved how, how, how much ever you have scientific experiments, scientific interventions, it will still take another few centuries at least to discover the secrets that they know. So it's not worth letting, letting them disappear. Um, that brings us to, when I say science, it brings us to uh, the controversy that exists in using TEK in quantitative scientific experiments. I don't know if any of your faces, but you cannot, it's very difficult to get um, acceptance to collecting traditional ecological knowledge as sufficient knowledge for proving something. For example, if you go to Canada, to the Inuits, they will tell you climate change is happening. How do they tell you? They will tell you that, well, we have July picnics, where 10 years back we went for those picnics on sleds, but now we go on boats. But that's how they tell you that climate change is happening. But that's not enough for the scientific community, because it doesn't give you, the, the thickness of the ice doesn't give you, I don't know, doesn't give you anything in numbers. But that's not justification enough, because these people know what they're talking about. There is nobody that understands their ecosystems better than them. But I should mention that there are, there are some scientists in some scientific circles who are trying to help others understand that traditional ecological knowledge is important. And one such research was in South India, in Karnataka, where you had uh, a group of scientists interviewing um, indigenous communities, and they figured out that these communities could recognize at least 30 different more species in their forests compared to the forest plot sampling methods. And so they, so they did some kind of research to let the academy co community accept the fact that TEK is important information. So yeah, the most, I think the, the, the basic problem uh, that they face is a lack of respect, that nobody respects them. Everybody thinks that they're backward and they don't have a master's degree or PhD, so they're illiterate. Um, but that's not always the case. Uh, and in fact, in their contribution to degrowth, I would say that degrowth is a concept that came up in 2006, but these guys have already been living that life for centuries. So it's not a very utopian idea. It's, it's been lived right this minute by surviving indigenous communities, and it will always be if we let them continue to survive. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.